four or five while uh, our past experience is that uh, this webinars people just try to finish the calls and walk in and so it might take time so what i will do is that i'll make sure that they don't miss uh, both anand and uh, just preet so i will use this time to set up and give a context so that when people join late they just don't miss uh, you people when when i started thinking about it the first thing i realized is that in english uh, language and in the dictionary there is no word called uh, rejuvenative rejuvenate is a word <laughs> so there is no word and uh, i wrote an article which uh, business today published and they had the same you know how editors are when they looked at that there is no word then i had to convince them saying that uh, we have cooked up a lot of new words in the past so while rejuvenative is not a word but possibly we need to really look at that so here is the thought process that went in and i first looked at it uh, from a very system thinking perspective that uh, when there are challenges externally usually what happens is that uh, whether a human being or a system to cope with that the way trees shed the leaves in winter how many anybody thought so i am not going to ask this difficult question to the panelist this question is for uh, the people who have joined in any idea why do trees uh, shed their leaves in winter to conserve what energy could be the reason nabila i think you have studied science trying to answer that yeah. why do trees uh, uh, tell me what's your answer to conserve energy right there's little less resources there's lesser sunlight so all the leaves will uh they will not be able to thrive because there's lesser resources to really you know survive upon that's right at a broader thing that's right and at a very specific level it also reduces where water going out from the leaves through a process called transpiration uh so then they can conserve water if leaves are uh, one leaves are not using water two uh the water the loss through the leaves uh, which is reduced so in the world from a system thinking perspective any system to cope up with an external challenge is about conserve resources reduce consumption reduce resources so i can cope with that yes and that's exactly what uh, will happen at, at an organization level we would try and say that how do we conserve when there is an external challenge barring few organizations in the country who are lucky uh or even globally most organizations possibly would be going through this challenging situation where they can't sell as much they thought they would sell their products they can produce as much they thought they would produce if they are into the manufacturing uh, setup they can't uh, touch their consult uh, clients the way they used to do if it is the case of a consulting firm like oda so all of us face these challenges and some of the organization might not have a direct linkage with this challenge but when the whole world at an individual level is also trying to conserve energy if you are not uh, a a robin hood platform or or a platform where youngsters who have extra money because they are not spending on commuting could invest in shares most companies would be feeling that uh, they need to conserve energy conserve resources conserve so there is in a typical metaphorical way that what the tree is doing is shrinking we shrink to cope with it now if you take a tree it's cyclic if the tree has a soul or an intellect tree will know that after winter 
the next season will come and things will be okay but that's not the case when it comes to organizations we don't know even if the next season come will take time to bounce so if you move from a tree to an animal in a in a nature when the resources are less they shrink physically and then it affects their ability to hunt <laughs> then because they are they are now shrinking so it's it's become a vicious cycle you know I, i'm small i've reduced my fat i'm trying to operate and survive which could then have an impact on the possibilities and opportunities and the vigor in which i could have actually gone and done things in the external world so it become a which is cycle from a system dynamic perspective so if anybody who studied system behavior and system dynamics will tell us the only way is not for the shrinking but to break this vicious cycle a long time ago who is that uh, mckinsey consultant who left and uh, wrote that book called in search of excellence and who also contributed to the 7s model anybody remember his name i have this foggy brain these days so the names do not pop up the faces pop up in my mind uh us mckinsey i and his book uh, in search of excellence is a cult book and he contributed also in his work on the 7s model this tom peters right? anybody knows his name uh wasn't it tom that's peters that's right tom peters now i remember <laughs> that's right tom peters tom peters said something very beautifully in those days you can't shrink and grow at the same time <laughs> and one of the classic uh, indian cases where uh, somebody was able to break this vicious cycle was long time ago when uh, when this uh, muraji desai came into power lot of uh, the boost companies share prices went down and there was one guy who kept buying all those shares <laughs> and he was trying to break the cycle and that government didn't last for long and this guy became very rich after that you will know his son who is in uk now <clears throat> so here i thought from a system dynamic perspective our quick reaction has been shrinking coping finding our pace and human beings when there is a stressful situation go through three stages which is called an alarm stage initially wow and organizations did that they were focusing on how do we make work from home possible how do we set up those technologies how do we think and we possibly thought this might take another couple of months this is called the alarm stage then when the situation is not changing we get into a very coping stage we we have to live with it and people keep saying that this is the new normal and we are living with that and when the coping stage uh, extend for long it just moves into a stage where a weakest organ in our body can get affected that's where stress affects so alarm stage is always good alarm stage is something that we experience before an exam it just put us awake and we wanted to have coffee at night and not to sleep and even if you want to sleep we can't sleep or when we fall in love in the initial stages uh we can't sleep after that uh, we feel that if i could sleep before you know quickly then that's better this is after some stage when you get into the coping stage uh so the alarm stage is usually good it just helps you to prepare but coping stage if it goes for a long time either for an individual or a system it, it just creates a lot of tiredness it just create uh, a, a feeling that we might put up a brave face to outside world but inside we're tired there is a fatigue there is and we don't know and the third stage is a breaking down stage where 
a weakest link in our body get affected, weakest part in an organization can get affected. So I felt that both by looking at a system dynamic perspective and looking at how human body or a human being faces stress, there could be learnings for organization. And that's where this whole word came up called rejuvenative. How do we break this cycle and rejuvenate the system so that like Tom Peters mentioned, we're not shrinking thinking that we will grow, but knowing that by shrinking, we can't grow. We need to create new aspiration. We need to create new positive uh, initiatives. We need to innovate. We need to inject more positive energy into the system. We need to look at growth. So that's an overall uh, context of having this discussion and the fact that the, the word never existed and we never thought about it, I thought uh, there could be a merit in discussing, sharing, and figuring out. But instead, if I say that future of work and everybody has a framework, uh, instead, if you say that uh, uh, this is a new structure, organizations worldwide are following, somebody has a framework. But I thought in this case, because there is no framework, because it's very intuitive, we, we haven't really articulated in this way, how do we shrink? And I, I also remember a beautiful saying by Sumantra Goshal, saying that leaders have to do two things simultaneously. One is cooking sour, which is about shrinking, cutting cost, making it really, really efficient. At the same time, cooking sweet, which is creating new aspiration, new dreams, new possibilities. But if you only cook sour, only look at efficiency, only look at shrinking, there is no energy left in the system. So we thought best way would be to start from a not knowing space and talk to leaders uh, in organizations First, to look at uh, this is how from an assumption perspective, but what's really going on? Is there a possibility that while we have done everything to shrink, is there something that we could do to rejuvenate the system? If yes, what should be? Then comes the question, do leaders have the capability? Are they trained? Do they have an idea about how do they want to do? Because the last thing they wanted now, while they're shrinking, is to call a consulting firm to do something. <laughs> because that, that doesn't come into the radar right now. Because all about is how do I reduce my cost and do it yourself. So that's the context in which I thought I will. And I, I got lucky, like most of the time in my life. And I got lucky when I bumped into a Ananda Hoja, who runs India's largest Man, uh, parallel manufacturing and export where someone who would have faced the, the ground level, the reality challenges and someone who would have thought about it, someone who would have possibly spent sleepless nights about uh, how do I cope with this? How do I keep my system intact? How do I manage through this crisis? And I got even more lucky when someone also has the designation, which I always say about him when I, after my first conversation with him, that someone who has a designation as an OD head for his own organization. Just, then just breathe uh, has been always, uh, it's a long association, just breathe has come and addressed our OD certification batch. Just breathe within RBS, I always found somebody who is uh, a role model leader who looks at uh, people processes, who looks at leadership, who looks at OD, who looks at culture building, and also somebody who has been an inspirational leader for at least the teams that he has been leading, and which is a large team within RBS. So I thought it's a very nice mixture. Someone who has an overall responsibility for an organization and an Indian organization, which we all need to be proud of, and I always have only one complaint about Anand that uh, I always believe that 90% we should do a good job and 10% we should talk about it. And Anand is not somebody who talks about it. 
Oh, he does ninety percent the good job. So we have Anand here, and we have uh, uh, Jaspreet, who uh, represent a large European uh, multinational uh, financial sector organization, who would also be feeling the heat. Uh, from an external perspective and also belong to an organization which is otherwise also going through a lot of changes. So that's where we are. Okay. I haven't said that before I hand it over. We have just exactly two minutes. If uh, any one of you have any, any on top of the mind things that you would like to bring up right now so that we address that. Well, I, I have painted a broad picture but in case if you have something about it after hearing this, that we should be focusing on this conversation, we are free. None of us have any slide deck. I haven't had a discussion with Anand or just breathe. We didn't have a trial run on what we need to do and knowing them. And I'm confident that we would be able to answer your question. So if there is anything that is, which is on top of your mind that you wanted to bring in, please do. And I'm going to shut up after this and just invite one by one. And uh, even if it is not one by one, it could be just picking up from what Ananda shares, uh, just breathe, you could, and what you share, Ananda, or, or some questions come up, uh, feel free. This is going to be a very informal and free flowing stuff. I call this uh, popcorn style. Anybody can pop up from anywhere. Any thoughts? <clears throat> Okay, good. That means we are all set. <clears throat> so the first is, uh, I wanted to ask with uh, Anand. Yes, I can see you now in the video. Anand, uh, when, uh, can you tell us when the first two months, what was kind of your thought when it came with all this lockdown happened in March, April, after that, uh, what are some of the stuff that you guys did to cop up? What was really going on? Could you share an inside information to help us understand what's happening in your world? Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, can you hear me okay? Is the sound all right? Yes. Okay, great, great. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me, uh, you know, be part of this discussion and for giving me this platform sort of talk about some of the experiences we've gone through. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm happy, like you said, to kind of just, you know, respond to what the group is interested to hear about or what you think is most fascinating to share. Um, so yeah, let, let me begin your first question. You know, I think uh, we can all relate to the fact that when COVID happened, it was a really intense experience, unexpected. Um, and I think we all, you know, had our own difficulties and challenges dealing with it. Um, for myself, you know, at a, at a personal level, I think in March, uh, when, when the country went, in, when the world went into lockdown, um, it was a scary time. I think everyone, you know, fear is a common sort of uh, response. I think most people had um, you know, there wasn't much info on what was going on, uh, what this meant for the world. I think it was probably the first time any of us ever experienced a pandemic. The last one was over 100 years ago. So I don't think anyone has survived from the Spanish flu to today to tell us what to expect from a pandemic. Um, all those lessons sort of get lost in, in you know, the previous, uh, you know, people who experienced the last pandemic. Um, so yeah, you know, I think the world started talking a lot about the safety measures, how to protect yourself. Uh, and, you know, there was a lot of discussions about using masks and doing this and doing that. So I think that was on my mind as it was, I'm sure for most people. In addition to that, I, you know, again, just on a personal level, I was thinking a lot about, you know, building healthy lifestyle habits and introspecting about that, the importance. So, you know, everything from sleep to diet to, you know, the right uh, supplements to be taking and making sure I was really building up my own immunity uh, in case, you know, whatever, whatever would happen. 
Um, and so I think that same response uh, at a company level, um, you know, was kind of happening in the sense that it, it forced uh, us as Shahi to really step back to think about, you know, what are the vulnerabilities of our business? Um, as you mentioned, Shahi is, you know, a large garment manufacturer based here in India. And what that means is we, we do contract manufacturing essentially. So we receive orders from the large global brands and retailers around the world, uh, Gap, H&M, all the, all the brands, you know, we, this group may be familiar with, and we manufacture them in our factories um, through a very labor intensive process. Uh, and then we ship them out. And, and once, once the goods are shipped and received, only after that we get our payments. So that's just kind of the system this industry follows. But um, you know, one of the challenges the industry has is that uh, it's a large workforce and wages or salaries make up about 30% of our cost. So when you think about that, and you also consider the fact that many companies were able to respond to this crisis by having their employees and team members work from home. But if you work in a garment factory, you don't have that option. Uh, we can't set up assembly lines at people's homes. So it really paused our ability to actually manufacture any goods. But um, in addition to that, we did have the responsibility to ensure that the salaries and wages of our large workforce were somehow paid for because you know the general demographic of a garment factory is we mostly employ low income unskilled rural women and for this group like you know one month of not paying salaries or sorry wages um, it can mean a lot it can mean the difference not to sound dramatic but you know in some cases even between life or death um, you know, if you're, if you're for, uh, facing starvation or other serious crises. So from that perspective, it really forced us to think about as a business, how should we be planning? What, um, you know, how much cash, re cash reserve should we keep? Uh, how much growth can we sustainably have? And, and how do we manage that? So, uh, you know, I'm speaking quite generally right now, but I'd be happy to go into specifics. Maybe I can pause here and... and you know. How many employees, Dr. Lannan, sir? So at Shahi, there's now um, 120,000 full-time employees. And these are uh, largely in tied to cities that... Uh... Yeah, so uh, we started by setting up many of our factories and, you know, we have some units here in NCR, but also in Bangalore and in more urban zones. But over time, it's living in a city and earning a minimum wage is not very sustainable. So instead of uh, you know, going down that path, we essentially have taken our factories closer to where the workers are. So we've moved them to tier two, tier three uh, towns across India and more rural places. Um, so that's where you know, it's kind of a split. We have about half of our factories in more urban locations and the other half more rural. Yes. So how did you? So what, what? What I hear you saying is that unlike large corporations, where even if there is salary reduction or job cuts, they can survive for a while, but the kind of population and the workers that you have for, for them, it is like a life and death. It can be. I mean, again, not to sound too dramatic, but when we're talking about the vulnerabilities, these are possible real situations. And then you think about, you know, if you compare ourselves, a, a group like Shahi to an IT firm, um, typically in IT firms, you know, you don't have 30% of your salary costs. You don't have such a high salary cost. So that's not, uh, you know, continuing to pay wages doesn't mean the same thing for the business. You mm -hmm. obviously have the ability to work from home when you're virtual and, and you know, digitally enabled. And um, yeah, and, and, you know, the like I said, you're not employing a group of workers who rely on the monthly paycheck in order to, to kind of survive. Um, and, and I think the main, the really, the main thing is that, you know, the pandemic really forced, the lockdown, I should say, really forced us to have to stop, you know, production in our factories. 
And fortunately, it was just for about a month, a little bit more than a month. But had it gone on longer, it's not clear how companies like us would have survived. Got it. So that was really on. So uh, was there anything specifically then as a management did uh, either to uh, emotionally give some kind of uh, a positive hope or even to help them that I can't give positive hope, but I can help you cope through this situation. So is there anything specifically you guys strategize to help the system manage this? Well, it was an interesting kind of journey, um, I think, for the top management. Uh, we, you know, had to deal with a lot of challenging. It was a roller coaster, I would say, because ultimately it all started like this. Factories are shut down because of the lockdown. We don't know when we can reopen them. We obviously have this burden of paying you know, huge amounts of money for wage, but we're not clear how we're going to do it in the, in the in a longer term. Um, at the same time, as I mentioned, the payment terms in our industry are such that we make the goods, we ship the goods, a few months later, we get our payment. So considering all of that, there were a lot of goods in production already, some that had even been shipped or were ready to ship. And our customers, unfortunately, you know, uh, responded I guess in a way that, you know, most people may have in a, with the strategy to kind of protect what, what they thought would be protecting their own business. So they started canceling orders. They said, we know you've, you know, invested in these, in these goods and these raw materials and this labor, but we can't take these orders. And to some extent, you know, it's a bit understandable, like their stores were closed, people weren't shopping. So what were they going to do with all these goods? So there was, a, there was that huge, huge kind of threat to our business, but the way the management dealt with it was by engaging, having a lot of dialogue with our customers and really stressing that, look, it's important that you honor your commitments. We're not asking for anything extra. We need you to uh, pay the orders that you've pay for the orders that you've made. And essentially, you know, this is important for the long-term sustainability of the supply chain. So I think at some point, you know, halfway through the initial lockdown, that first month, there was a shift in thinking. You had brands like H&M really leading the way and saying, look, we know it's not right to do this. We won't cancel any orders. And I think most of the brands followed after. So the reason I'm sharing all that is because first, it was really just figuring out that situation, the orders. Once the orders were secured again, then the mentality became shifted to our factories how and when can we safely reopen our factories to actually complete these orders, get them out to our customers on time and, uh, you know, uh, get the payments that, that um, we had, we've negotiated. So then the shift was all about how do we create a safe working environment so that our workers can return to the factory. And that's where I think it became much more important for us to uh, communicate with workers think about the anxieties and, and, and honestly the risks associated with running the business and begin to really plan our strategy for running 60 factories with 120,000 people. Great. Uh, I wanted to ask at this stage uh, with just breathe. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Uh, I have a slight uh, disturbance on this side when uh, Anand was speaking at the last. I want to know whether it's on my side. I I I, I can Santosh. I can hear I, me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Loud and clear. Good. So th this is one kind of a reality and you are in a very different industry, multinational firm with supporting from India. Uh, do, do you people inside your organization have had any kind of such uh, fears, challenges, or is it uh, 
is it was completely different from what we hear from Anand in your case. So, so just to be honest, I think what what Anand shared, uh, you know, the reality of every industry, every sector uh, was different. But there were certain basic underlying things, underlying themes that were very, very mm. common. Right? Uh, and, and I think that what really defined that. No matter what kind of industry or sector you are, uh, any change in one sector will have a direct or an indirect impact coming in. Right? So just, just from our standpoint, and, and uh, we, are a, we are a large banking organization, uh, I think what this pandemic has uh, helped us realize is uh, the people want banking, not necessarily mm -hmm. banks, which basically means that the whole construct of what a bank does uh, and how we support colle uh, colleagues internally, how we support customers has to go through a drastic change. Right? So when the time started, it was very, very different. And I, you know, to what Anand said, if I could just add, uh, for me as a leader or the management team, I think there were two or three basic things that were panning out. The first and the most important thing was, what does it mean for me and my immediate family? Because the risk was same, right? And you can't take care of anyone else unless you take care of yourself. So that uncertainty, the risk, uh, that whole fear of this infection being so fatal, I think we were trying to decipher that and get to understand that better in our mind. Then came our team and the businesses we support. And then came the customers, the colleagues, and the stakeholders that we used to manage, right? So very different reality. And I think that took some time to uh, settle in. Uh, I still remember uh, if I go back to the starting of the year, I think this time holy celebrations in the country were canceled, but people still came together. They didn't play holy, but people still came together in smaller groups across because the reality of this was yet to sink in. It's only, I think, March end and April when we when this whole lockdown piece started coming in, we realized that, oh, this is not as simple and this is going to really take some time, right? So that was what the starting point was, Santosh, to be honest. And, and as an organization, uh, we are part of a global organization. We have around 14,000 colleagues in India supporting global operations. I think for us, the key was, one, how do we really make sure that we take care of our colleagues and their well-being, health, safety, security came first. Uh, once we were able to establish that is when we then started looking at how do we drive continuity from a delivery standpoint? Because important element for us to keep in mind is that what we do here or are not able to do can have a direct impact on customers in UK or Europe. So we had to make sure that there is a continuity there as well. And I think that was the focused intervention that we did week on week and month on month. Right. So, so not 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 an easy journey to be honest at that time. But yeah, I think that's what we we focused on as we worked on over the last couple of months. Got it. Now, what I wanted to ask then to Anand is that uh, based on my earlier assumptions about how nature tried to break this cycle. Uh, are there any thoughts around, because the first priorities are anyway going to be put the business back into some kind of a state, make uh, some of our new plans work, but at the same time, is, is it a serious concern to really look at how do we engage uh, people to generate or create more positive energy, more aspiration? Would this, I have a basic hypothesis that after two years, we might have a best art pieces because art and literature always flourished when we went through bigger challenges. And I don't hear those conversations. Would these challenges help us to develop, create some innovative ways of looking at our organization? Would there be a serious thought about, uh, yeah, maybe another two months, but we need to really look at injecting new enthusiasm, energy into the system. If yes, how does it translate into? Is it about creating new vision? Is it about what we thought we will do in 2020 might not be working? What are the plans to rebounds? What could be the plans to re-energize 
or to use that uh, not the grammatically correct word, what are the plans to rejuvenate? If it is an individual, we say, I'm going to a spa for a month. And I use that, and people are really willing to get out and do something to rejuvenate themselves. But is there any thought that you've heard in your organization somewhere? While we need to cope, why need to plan? There could be also a need to reinstall, re-energize, reprogram, recreate some of the new initiatives, innovation, thoughts, aspirations. Other than this is clearly differentiated with the stuff that we do to manage you know, the reality. Is there any such thoughts, thought process, any, any ideas around? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think like for us at Shahi, you know, there is both, uh, we have a large staff, uh, yeah. corporate staff. And then obviously um, I talked a little bit about our, our workforce. So, you know, it is essentially one large company and, you know, one family, but um, the context is slightly different. So for the corporate staff, uh, I think this, was an opportunity to really modernize our approach to, you know, HR and workplace uh, norms and, and um, just the way we get work done, you know, like uh, we're traditional in the sense that everyone, um, I guess part of it is in solidarity with the factory workers. Um, the corporate team also works six days a week. Uh, every day people show up at the office the office and the factory are actually in the same building. So there is this kind of sense of solidarity that, that on which Shahi was built. Um, but I think this was a reality check that, you know, we have to enter the future um, and we have to think, put some of these ideas or I guess traditional notions past us when we think about, um, you know, working remotely, doing things virtually, uh, having meetings over Zoom instead of in person, um, even with the way we interact with our customers, right? Like one of the issues that the garment industry often gets criticized for is the huge amount of waste um, that it generates, not just through production, but also in the, in the process of design. You know, we make samples, we send them, they get approved, they get rejected, we make more samples. So I think all of these uh, traditional ways of working were questioned in a way that hadn't really been done as, as critically. And I think a lot of innovative solutions are starting to come out, whether it's things like digital sampling, um, whether it's you know, uh, approving things and not uh, being tied down by traditional approaches of how we think things should run. Um, I think uh, even just knowing which customers are most resilient so, uh, you know, I think there's a shift in what people are wearing these days. We're all wearing shirts right now, but I think it's quite, it's much less popular uh, to have formal workwear these days. So uh, the companies that did do best, the brands that did do best were obviously serving a different need or maybe just inherently more prepared for um, a crisis like this. Whether you think about Walmart, that's actually selling clothes and food and all types of goods uh, as compared to someone, you know, just in a particular category. So, so yeah, that, 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 I guess that refers to the corporate side of the business. And then in terms of, um, you know, the actual factory and the operations, one of the challenges that the garment industry faces, uh, it's sort of an endemic issue, is the fact that there's really high rates of attrition. So, you know, just to put it in perspective, just at a company like Shahi, any of our, at any given time, our factories can have eight to 10% monthly attrition. So meaning to say like in a month, 10,000 people could quit and we would have to rehire new people. Um, and I think these issues, these leakages, people have tried really hard to solve them. But in some sense now, I think um, there's a whole different approach to, to jobs. People value their jobs a bit more if you do have a stable job that's allowing you to earn an income, you know, maybe you're less likely to kind of, uh, you know, jump between jobs, leave it. And in some sense that has re re like rejuvenated 
the approach to manufacturing. Now the conditions are not ideal. There are high anxiety levels and stress and it's not sustainable in the long term. But it has been interesting to observe how factories have been able to bounce back, how, you know, despite all these challenges, there haven't been huge, um, you know, infection spreading, number of cases rising. That hasn't been a huge barrier. And productivity is relatively high, I think, just by the nature of, you know, the pressure and stress. And again, to your point, like some level of stress and emergency response can actually be positive. But I think over time, you know, it can also be draining. So I think now is a crucial moment for us. I have another question to, uh, to spread. I also noticed from a both systemic perspective and from a psychological perspective, while all of us experience the challenges, but the senior leadership or at home, the parents, they tend to take things on their shoulder more. While obviously the kids are having the problems, workers are having their problems, but somehow the responsibility comes to senior management. And in that process, they are burdened and they do what is right for the overall system. But have you noticed that this is also an opportunity to involve everybody in co-creating something? Because at least the leaders that I have worked with in the past a lot, uh, they were very good in taking responsibility on themselves, their shoulders and trying and having sleepless nights and figuring out things. And one of the things that I always ask them, uh, have you also involved in this overall process a large number of people in the organization and reached out and say that, do you have ideas on how do we really want to go about this? Is there a large scale participatory process which uh, RBS in terms of collecting information from people, how do we cope or have you seen anywhere outside as an opportunity? to bring everybody to the world affected rather than some senior people uh, trying to figure out how to cope with this. So, so Santosh, I think this probably is the biggest dilemma that most of the senior leaders faced. It was not just for them and their immediate family, they were also accountable for the teams as well as the businesses, right? And then they were also being aware of what's happening in the ecosystem. So if you look at from a leadership standpoint, there were a few things that were very, very important. The first is, how do you focus on now, mm -hmm. right? And when this pandemic, and, and now could start with the basics of how do you take care of your people? How do you engage with your people? How do you talk to them and help them understand that these uncertainties will settle over a period of time, right? So that was a very, very important element, which was time consuming, but very, very required. Uh, and, and something that really put a lot of stretch for the leaders. At the same time, they were also required to make sure that there is a sustainability of revenues of delivery, right? And that had to happen over and above making sure that they're taking care of the well-being of people. And, that, and, and the third element at that time in here and now was, can you start thinking about what does future look like? Which was completely unclear, mm. right? So if I just look at the here and now, in different scenarios, different approaches got adopted. So for example, when we spoke about the well-being, leaders could not drive the well-being when you're talking about organizations like 14,000 or 120,000. It has to be done working very, very closely with the managers, with the leaders, with the employees, right? Because the realities were very different. So those, the statement that has stuck with me at the start of this is where somebody said, we are in the same storm, but different boats. The realities of employees and the workforce across varied, right? So as a management team, as a leadership, you cannot assume that one solution will fit all. So first understanding what the realities are, what will work, what will not work. Well-being, whether we talk about financial, emotional, physical, there are multiple things. So that's where we involve people. We, we sought ideas, suggestion, volunteers on what we can do, right? Then came sustaining delivery, because the focus was very, very different. Idea was how do we make sure that we are able to get people empowered to work from home? Luckily, as compared to what Anand said, we were in a position to allow colleagues to work from home, given we were a digital technology-based platform, right? But it was not done overnight. 
uh, getting 6,000 colleagues laptops and UPS and tables and chairs and getting them up to speed onto the server. Also, does our technology background and the infrastructure has the wherewith to cope up with this kind of work from home? Uh, so focusing on that, we involved some people. So that was here in now, Santosh, where we did some conversations. I think for a leader, what was also important is also to look at what next. And that had to happen simultaneously. Leaders were not in a position to say, okay, I'll wait for the next six months, seven months, see how things work, and then you know, start planning a future. So the next piece becomes very, very important. Right? One, I think very, very clear realization that this is unpredictable, probably will get more unpredictable. I think there was a realization that the recovery will be slow and unmuted to a very big extent. Uh, I think the other pieces, everybody start, started talking about using a term new normal. I'll be honest, we still don't know what new normal is. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows that, right? So in that space, probably that was where the leadership had to think from a very strategic standpoint and maybe the involvement was at our only senior level and also looking at the customer patterns. So different things where the involvement was at different levels. And I think that's what really helped us sustain this particular time over the last seven. And I, it's not just valid for NatWest. I'm sure every organization did that. Uh, and and, and so if, if I can, you know, just, just add on one element to what uh, Anand said. See, every organization has been going through massive change and churn. Uh, but I think now there is a realization that there are three categories as I see. It is, it is improvement, it is uh, renovation, or it is reinvention. Today we are in the third phase, which is no longer incremental changes. We have to reinvent the model. And I think that's what most of the companies are relooking at. I'd like to uh, pause now and ask the group that, would you have any specific questions? And if you also suggest to me, whom are you addressing this question? Uh, that will be useful, whether it is to just read or if it is to Anand. Um, hi, Santosh, this is Eric here. Yeah. So uh, this question is specific to um, I can imagine that uh, the amount of workforce that you have uh, is quite large from, from that perspective. So, so when you spoke about positive reinforcement in some way or, or even uh, you know, uh, the fact that salaries are important, uh, all that stuff is great, but how do you manage to pass on communication and ensure that groups of people remain positive and how did you um, sort of focus on listening on the ground because it becomes a lot more harder. So what were some of the initiatives and thoughts around that would be very useful. This is to Anand, right? Yes. Yeah. It's a good question. I mean, um, you know, dealing with uh, a lot of the issues that Jaspreet was talking about has its own challenges, of course, and complexities um, and even expectations. Uh, I think at the kind of blue collar worker level, um, especially for garment workers where digital literacy is quite low, um, obviously, you know, low income households, a lot of, you know, workers belong to low income households. Uh, access to even smartphones is quite limited. We see that even in our urban factories, sometimes the smartphone penetration is as low as 30%. So all these pose issues where it's hard to have a blanket approach. Um, we really rely on um, a decentralized approach. Each factory kind of runs at its own company. The factory head is kind of like the CEO the supervisors are, um, you know, the first line of management. And of course, the workers are, are, you know, at the front lines. So I think we relied a lot on these um, decentralized, almost informal channels of communication. But I think one thing that helped us was uh, over the years, Shahi has been investing a lot in worker well-being, in building loyalty, building sort of a positive, you know, uh, relationship with workers. Uh, so there is a level of trust. Um, I think we were all kind of in the dark about what was happening with COVID, but even so, you know, it's possible for our workers, they may have had even less information, but I sense that there was an inherent trust that Shahi would prioritize their well-being, 
Um, and the things that we had done, you know, specifically to talk about a few innovative things, uh, all our factories as per, you know, the Factories Act have grievance channels. There are, you know, platforms and channels for workers to ask questions, share their concerns and all of that. But many of them tend to be traditional, more analog systems, suggestion boxes, approaching HR, worker committee meetings, um, you know, things like that. So what we had developed almost a year and a half ago was actually a digital communication channel. But again, it wasn't based on uh, smartphone technology. It was a SMS and a voice message, an anonymous uh, SMS and voice message system. So we had just launched it actually a couple months prior to the lockdown and it hasn't fully been, you know, uh, penetrated our factory. So only about 30 factories have this tool running, slightly less actually. And, but where it is running, we have seen adoption rates are, you know, usage rates are going up. The management is very, you know, uh, in these factories tends to want to rely on these tools to actually connect with workers, find out what's happening on the ground, um, you know, even inform them, broadcast messages. So, so I think the whole, the response to all of this is to lean on some of the innovative ideas that were already in the pipeline, but just rely on them more and uh, continue to innovate on them so that, you know, we can solve all these, all these upcoming problems. Thank you. Thanks. Can I ask a question? Because uh, it's yeah. it's it's more uh, you know that I experienced both sides of it, like I being in IT and my husband being in mechanical. So he was uh, you know uh, overnight all the production of uh, cars went off and you know n salary cuts and everything happened. On IT, digitalization came as a kind of uh, a challenge in uh, connecting with. So each layer. So I would like to understand from you, Anand and Jaspreet both, uh, when we are today as well talking about innovative means of uh, sensing and responding to the challenges, obviously COVID has been altogether a different kind of challenge. But otherwise, did you as a leader see that from the ground, everyone, anyone who could really sense the situation say it like as unmasked way to leadership as it could have helped better or it was again you know pretty much a broadcasting and then trying to uh, go with predict and plan rather than sensing and responding so how did you experience that in these tough times uh, yeah yeah i can so so I think this is a very, very pertinent question and a very important challenge that many organizations have faced. Uh, one thing there is a realization is that most of the channels that have been developed in organizations were for cascading of information. There was never an ability to feed information up. I think what COVID and this time has done is we've been able to relook at that philosophy. Two, it's not about the management or the leadership only at that level trying to do something a lot of work and a lot of focus has to be done by the people who are the real-time managers. How do you enable and empower the managers that they can understand these realities, right? So, so for our, if I just talk about our, our franchise in India at a 14,000 man uh, headcount, we have 2,400 managers. How do you enable and empower the managers to pick up the right skill sets in that short span of time? How do you enable them to use technology in the right span of time that they can connect with the teams? It's very difficult to, when, when this size and scale of organization to be able to touch and connect with everyone and then pick up feedback. So what we did was we adopted something known as a 70-30 approach where 70% was cutting across the organization basics. Uh, leaves, leave policy, making sure that people have the infrastructure and as I said, laptop chairs, et cetera. And how does this work out? But you know, when we started getting into the 30%, we realized that's where the challenge comes in. So for example, we are okay to give a, a table and a chair to a colleague, but the colleague come back and says, my house is so small, I can't accommodate at a table and a chair, for example, just a very simple, right? 
so how do you then focus on those interventions at the at, for every colleague and how do you support them so what we've been able to do is we've been able to institutionalize and embed certain challenge of free flow information inputs feedback suggestions uh, and then this is majorly tech enabled to make sure that colleagues can connect managers can connect they can voice their inputs feedback concerns ask need and 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 management owners how do you make sure that you respond back so i think that's something that has helped us uh, to cover this journey so far it may be i could uh, not really come as clear as i wanted to uh, but idea was you know that that few things are uh, how does the feedback flow from bottom up and few things are that how does that organization develop a culture which uh, you know instills this naturally to challenge the status quo to respond at any level in a empowered way so i think all the ideas that you spoke about and i was amazed at the way anant uh, really brought on you know remote working for corporate uh staff versus the workers on the assembly line because i think that was pretty much a uh, uh, going away from the preconceived notion and traditional way of working where that equality and everything is talked about and talked about very in a very literal sense so so that's that's from where my question was coming from that you know how do we keep a balance of those like challenging the status quo and also uh, pulling out the levers which are best for the current and tough times otherwise so yeah. agree so so you know, as i said tell different things different solutions so i'm sure the organization you work for there are ways by which employee feedback is collected uh, majorly this at times is limited to once a quarter once a year in covid time we institutionalized something which was a feedback mechanism every fortnightly which was pure play related to covid imagine getting almost 7000 to 8000 feedback every month articulating specific ask issues and there is a team in the back end trying to just look at that and trying to address that so different solutions multiple solutions that were put in place just to make sure that we are able to not just share information but also capture the ask and engage colleagues at that time thank you yeah i'll just add a word or two but i think it's a really interesting question you posed how do you sort of if i'm understanding correctly how do you balance between you know questioning everything as as an existential threat might make you to also like being practical um i'm not really sure if there's an answer a good answer that i could provide to that but i do think that you know my reflection at least is that um you know covid was perceived as a really existential risk or a risk that really threatens even the destruction of humanity's kind of long-term potential and the risk was taken really seriously by the world and uh you know there's obviously a lot of suffering that's come out of it but at the same time i think it has forced companies to ask the tough questions and even just to ask like what is our role what's our purpose you know we saw we we do uh, there was i think a shift in terms of more and more businesses centering around purpose but covid really forced companies i think at least at some levels to introspect about what is our purpose why are we here what are we doing you know what are what are we trying to do and then that essentially lets you um when you ask these basic questions they may seem simple but i guess it allows you to really you know rebuild some fundamental aspects of the business and of course keep the things that are essential thank you both thank you what's there any other questions anyone else uh, yeah S santosh i have one question this is to both jaspreet and anand see i think uh, the good uh, part of this pandemic is that uh, every organization in its own they have found out ways and means of uh, adjusting to this new normal and as jasprit said probably we still don't know what the new normal is but there is a there is a course in which people are moving and hoping that there is a new normal which we are all which we all are going to get adjusted to but the fundamental question which i want us to both of you which is having an implication is 
what did you guys do in order to take care of the not so obvious mental health and well-being of employees there are obvious things which you have addressed and like anant he said that hey uh, all these uh, people who are uh, from the low income category for them if you don't pay them the salary or wages it's going to impact their life pretty much badly or for just great oh no problem i think we have shifted their desktops and laptops to their residences and then we started working back but there is there is one obvious thing which is there in in both these situations the mental health and well being so what did you guys do i am very curious to know about what did you guys do in in order to take care of that part uh so i took a very very good question and, and i think that's something that most of the organizations would be definitely because i can share from what we did at the bank and then adam can add on from shahi uh i think the idea was as i said the the first and foremost focus was here and now and then that included the well-being of colleagues uh the first was providing them the financial security which means very very clearly an announcement day one no jobs will be lost no salary will be cut till october this is way back in march and we've still not done that so that provided some financial uh, stability in at least people's mind because there was a lot of uncertainty then came in the whole construct of how do we make sure that we provide you the right support so whether it was providing uh, enhanced insurance coverage whether it was providing basic things like uh, a, a doctor on call as an extra piece whether it was providing counseling and coaching services but that was providing enhanced leaves just in case if somebody in your family was getting impacted because of covid or even a category of extra care that you need to provide then came in the ability of loans so small small things that made a difference but i think one thing that was very very clearly told to all the colleagues was it's your well being health first then comes the work so if a colleague come came back and said i'm not able to work 10 hours or i have challenge because i have to dabble with multiple things we really looked at their work we looked at the stack we looked at what we can do to support them we provided complete flexibility to colleagues across to make sure that they can work at their own terms when they can we let go of the productivity measures we let go of the performance measures for that period so when you are when you are removing so many boundaries and trying to make that working simple and and easy i think it automatically makes a difference but yeah to be honest have we been able to completely remove it's not just the work stress there are multiple other stress there is a zoom fatigue for example for many of us just being conscious and trying to make sure what we can do one step at a time i think that's what probably helps and that's what we have been able to do wonderful thank you jasper yeah that's great to hear i'm really inspired to hear some of the things that uh you know uh, just speak that you shared in terms of to take those steps as a corporation um it's a, it's a really positive approach and i think it contradicts the narrative that people tend to have about business that you know essentially business is you know just maximizing profit i think it's doing a lot more than that in some cases um you know i think uh mental health like you know um obviously at, at at an individual level there's a lot of personal things people can do to really ensure that their own mental health is good that they continue to bring positive energy to their organizations and it it can be little things like when we talk about zoom fatigue one thing that i've been doing is not taking video calls as much and just uh taking more audio calls just to have less screen time to be able to walk and talk to be able to you know not just sit in my room all day on on you know multiple hours of zoom calls so little things like that can really be uh rejuvenating uh in the theme of today's discussion I'll, I'll use that word um and then i think you know in addition to shahi i'm also uh a, a co-founder of good business lab which is a it's a not for profit labor innovation company and our motto has always been uh worker well-being is good business so we've been trying to make the case for how uh investing in your workers um is good for business in 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 you know in the right ways when you invest in your workers in the right ways it can potentially be good for business so um you know everything from you know 
all, all different types of initiatives. I won't go into too much detail, but the reason I bring that up is just to say that I think COVID made this motto very much real. Um, companies like Shahi obviously knew that it's valuable to protect workers' health, but now it's critical to the business. Um, if, if a factory can't protect workers' health in this time, then the risk is very real because your you know, cases spread, your factory is sealed, suddenly you can't produce your goods and everything is you know, uh, threatened. So I think um, uh, just being able to sustain operations, you do need to protect people's health, uh, physical health, but then the mental health conversation is really complex. I think right now we're just scratching the surface on you know, what some of these issues may lead to, um, what some, I mean, what this crisis may lead to the types of issues. So I think uh, I don't have enough of a perspective on this yet. I'm, I'm you know, um, definitely thinking a lot about things like burnout, like uh, just the challenges of working from home. I read somewhere that, uh, you know, we shouldn't call it work from home. We should call it living from work because essentially some people are always turned on now as opposed to having that natural go to office, get your work done, come home and, you know, separating the two experiences. So I think there's still a lot for us to work through and learn. But in terms of mental health, I think, um, you know, uh, the, I guess the only positive way to say it is I think there's a renewed focus on the importance of this. And I'm hopeful that a lot of good solutions will come out of it. Thank you. And Shekhar uh, uh, has raised the hand and before you, I come to you. Just wanted to share that uh, what Anand does with his nonprofit, I have a feeling uh, uh, has a lot of uh, value for other organizations who are here to learn a little bit more about uh, uh, the intent by which he started this nonprofit and some of his insights, not for today, but uh, provided if he has time, I, I strongly urge you to connect uh, with him and see if your senior leaders in your organizations could learn about uh, the thought behind starting this nonprofit and working and researching in this area. Uh, do reach out and if we can spend some time, I think uh, his insights and his experience could translate and could have some valuable stuff that other organizations could adopt and provide. Yes, Shekhar. Yeah. Uh, so uh, thanks both Anand and Jaspreet. A um, uh, lot of insightful uh, views. Uh, my question is for Jaspreet. While uh, the bank is um, reorganizing and uh, creating its own capability and capacity, what has been on the customer side? How are you orienting yourself? What do you see is the changing perception requirements from the customer? And how do you sort of uh, organize and adjust? While it's the same thing for Anant also, uh, I, I come from uh, retail industry. I see there is a uh, degrowth of about 30, 40% in the business. So how, how would uh, Sahi sort of look at their buyers also? I mean, anybody can start and then I would want to see or hear from both of you. So Shikhar, that's the business reality. And, and, and I'll talk from a banking sector organization. Uh, but before I answer that, I'll just put it on us, you and me, and, and get to understand. In the last six months, many of us wouldn't have taken any mortgage, most likely. Wouldn't have bought any new car. The spending on credit card would have drastically reduced. And to many places, people would have preferred to take out cash from ATMs and keep it at home handy. right? So for a bank... Uh, the revenue margin drastically shrinked. In fact, the focus shifted to how do we keep up float and how do we remain that liquidity ratio, right? And that has to happen to make sure that we're able to support the customers. That was the first part. The second part was a uh, lot of customers were in vulnerable condition. UK, if you look at the population, there is a sizable population above 60 years of age. How do you make sure that you support them? Even if it means our teams have to reach out to them, go to their places and get the cash available to them. So that became a second focus for us. Mm -hmm. The third was if there were mortgages that were running and if there were people who were not able to pay, how do we give them that, that extra time? How do we cut down interest rate? How do we provide and wave off anything to do with penalties? How do we provide overdraft facilities? Because people, businesses are suffering. 
right? So how do we provide them overdraft facility and, and include that into our risk appetite that we are being the good citizen trying to help a customer, but if, if the money doesn't come back, what can we do, right? Multiple things, as in we are a bank, we only exist because customers have the trust to keep the money in the bank. And if we are not able to support the customers at a time when they really need, I think the purpose was defined. So Anand used the word and we have, we have now become a purpose-led bank. We call ourselves a purpose-led bank to an extent that we are exiting businesses which are not doing the right thing in the market, including, for example, the carbon footprint. So I think that was the only single point agenda from a leadership standpoint that how do we really support customers at this time? That's very, very uh, great. Uh, so I think uh, purpose, more definition of purpose coming from you. Thanks, just and then would like to hear from um yeah i'd be happy to respond maybe could you rephrase the question or or repeat the question in terms of what you would yeah. want to and then, so what i uh, hear from uh, all the uh, retail majors uh, yeah. not just naming them yeah their business has dropped down by 30 40% revenue by, uh, by revenue yeah and hence it will essentially uh, sort of impact buying also and hence how are you seeing the uh, preferences of uh, supply or need or the total requirement consumption uh, to uh, supply? How do you, how is the supply chain um, changed? Mm. And uh, then how does the, of course, cash uh, payments are the major thing in retail and yeah. especially for garments. So how, how has it changed there? I think, I mean, yes, yeah, it's been tough for some companies for sure. Um, and some have reacted in really surprising, even disappointing ways where they have, you know, canceled orders, not made payments to suppliers and essentially left workers, you know, helpless in these situations. But we've also seen some really positive steps that some have taken. I'm sure you're all familiar with the, with the company Gap. They took out a $2 billion loan to pay for all the orders that they had because they believe in the long term sustainability of the supply chain. They know that they're here to stay and they want to invest in ensuring that supply chain workers, you know, do get paid. So um, it's been interesting to observe how different people have reacted. I mean, I think like, you know, if you ask the group that's here, I wonder, you know, how many people have bought clothes since COVID? What, what has been the trend? What has been the behavior? Because I think in general, there was obviously, you know, much less retail activity at one point. But at some point, I, I think there was also like a lot of online shopping happening. So a lot of brands have benefited from that. They didn't invest as much in their online stores. And now it's become a source of, of revenue that's in some cases even compensated for the loss of the in-store you know, sales. Thanks, Anand. Yep. Thank you, thanks. Great. If there are, uh, is there any other questions? Otherwise, we could uh, slowly, I think, uh, wind up today's discussion. Any thoughts from anybody else? No. Okay. Then I'll use this opportunity to really thank uh, uh, Anant uh, and Jaspreet to join uh, in a non grammatically correct terminology of rejuvenative leadership uh, and at least uh, you know start uh, thinking about a uh, parallelly about something which we don't have a clear answer to because i'm a strong believer that it's easier to jump into something that we have a clear answer and then we are just following we keep asking about what's the benchmark what other people are doing but what we are experiencing is something that we just don't have an answer but we know that somehow parallelly while we are doing cooking the sour, we possibly also need to figure out how to cook the sweet and re-energize the system. And which is a dilemma. That's not something that comes naturally to us which is when we are facing these challenges. With that, uh, as Shalu says, uh, let's reflect, revive, rejuvenate self and the system. So she just gave me the words. <laughs> to say uh, as the last uh, sentence from my side. If anybody wants. And thank you so much, everyone.
Thank you all. Thank you, Nurse. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, all. Bye. You and thank you, Jasprit. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.